right, everybody. So I see that you've dropped out of the comments there in YouTube. Clearly, everybody off to trade uh, China. So we are going to go to uh, your questions of the day. What have we got for this Friday special? What are the common mistakes to avoid in risk management? That's a good one for you, Ben Boswell. Are you <laughs> jumping into your upstart again last night? But on a wider scope right let's look at this as risk management as a whole because there are a few different areas to go through now how do we start looking at risk management well first of all it's with the amount the size of the trades that you put on in the first place right oh, now the Axel, sizing. it's the sizing exactly time you got to get to be um, a strong performer over the medium term to see growth in your portfolio and the returns. It's all about timing and size. Now, Axel Rudolph says that he only feels comfortable risking 3% of his capital at any one time. So where he's putting his buys, sells, stops, take profits, that's to risk 3% um, of his capital. I feel um, we've gone over the chessboard in, in past, and we'll do, we'll do a whole segment on that sometime in the near future. But there are four opportunities a year when you get a real, real nice trade with a, with a great opportunity where the upside really outweighs the downside. But how do you get to recognize them? Mm. How do you recognize when that upside potential outweighs the um, the downside risks. That is something that you get from your, your trading strategy and your trading plan. As Anne says, you put in the guardrails, okay? Learning from your mistakes and learning from your emotional state, That's it. you'll know exactly when you're in the right frame of mind to pick a, um, an opportunity that has that significant upside. So the way to do that is detail even how you feel when you're putting trades on and write those down in a journal or make some observation or chat to people about it, mm. right? Come into the comments section and chat to us about it. Um, I mean, we've all been there before. We talked about, and you hear Rich talk about this, you know, all the time. If he wants, you know, if he wants um, time out, he goes for a walk, clear or run, clear a mind, mm, and then you come back in, right? Yeah. Um, I even have a diary to kind of put out, you know, which stocks I should not trade because if I look back at my history, I get that ro stock wrong. It's like my kryptonite, right? So, like, I won't touch Bitcoin uh, or crypto related because I, more often than not, somehow or another, it whacks me. I just don't get it right. Everyone's got a kryptonite. Um, you know, don't worry about it. Just understand what your kryptonite is. Um, my best trades and my highest... Um, chance of making a good trade is when I'm most awake. Surprise, <laughs> surprise. And that would be early in the morning. My worst trades are when I'm most tired. And because I'm up so early with Rich every day, that happens to be 2 to 3 p.m. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Our studio director said, like, we well, you know the feeling, Ange. Mm. So um, that risk management, you, you hear Rich, uh, Rich talk about, you know, buffet and ordering a la carte as well, right? If you're not so um, sure about the stock or it's the first time you're trading that stock, you might want to do extra research. You might want to take a look at perhaps not putting all your eggs in one basket. Maybe go for the buffet style, so the ETF where it's within that basket. Um, That's right. We've looked at the one of one of Sahil's research pieces has been um, about diversification yes. and about how you can reduce those risks in um, trading ETFs or indices rather than single stocks. We've seen hum some horrific moves this week, right? John Wood Group, um, Air France down nine percent, AstraZeneca. I mean, you know, who would have thought that a stock like AstraZeneca would be down near double digit? Um, you've had in the past 18 months, Rick at Ben Kieser, uh, down 20%, I think mm -hmm. it was in one day. You can see here, if you trade indices, if you trade ETFs rather than those single stock risks, that takes 
um, some of the risk out of it. But there are also um, those real occasions when you have a strong feeling for the management, the product, uh, the valuation, the technical analysis, when all those things come together. It all aligns. When it all aligns, mm. then the correct thing to do is get your sizing right, okay? Personally, I like the, well, you could, you could have a look at the DCA entry points, right? The DCA entry points are when you just, you put in, you know, something out of your, um, you know, salary uh, to build up your investment portfolio over the medium term. There's also the price trigger strategy, and that is the one that I used NVIDIA as an example. On August the 5th, you saw NVIDIA um, trade down to 92, and I had bids in there at 97, 95, 93, and 91, and never got hit in 91. But there are various different types of strategy, and that's what I mean by just learning what's best for you, what is, um, suits your risk appetite, and what suits your skill level and patience. Mm -hmm. If you go too big too early, then you put yourself under a pressure, you put yourself under mental stress, mm -hmm. and you don't think clearly. And that's the most important mm. thing. And mental, mental fatigue is a thing. So you need to understand when you're mentally fatigued, close that trading book, that trading diary, trader friends, walk away, come back when you're refreshed. Um, what's also interesting is what Sahil keeps saying, right? Mm -hmm. if, if the stars align and you've made a really good um, position, it's worked out, you've done better than you expected, right? Then understand how the mechanics of probability works. Then you need to walk away, right? You're not going to win all the time. That's the name of the game. Understanding your guardrails, when to walk away, and probability, implied probability. That's why we talk about that so often on this show. Now, Andrew McKelvey's got a, a great um, question there that I would like to address. Because I've sat on the floor at Credit Suisse as a market maker for 10 years. I've also sat in Macquarie Bank and over the back of me were the guys that were trading the small and mid cap stocks, right? So Andrew asked, can you talk about the AIM stocks and specifically if you think prices are manipulated as often alleged on share chat sites? Absolutely not at all, right? There is no way that the FCA would allow anything like that to happen. And trust me, there are investigations into price moves. They've got incredible technology to watch price moves that flags up people from banks and, you know, personal retail traders at home if they think anything strange is going on. Their technology is way beyond anything of any trading um, platform. What happens is that you get a, a sales trader will get a phone call and say, you know, I, I don't know, I don't want to use a specific stock, but um, they'd say, you know, what are you doing in XYZ? bank. Now, the market maker has um, a, a price um, where they're prepared to sell and a price where they're prepared to buy. Sales trader comes on. If it's, you know, a, a big client of the firm, um, then the sales trader will say, is it possible to sell you some first on risk? Right? So they might have a total order of 500,000 shares or 5 million shares. And they'll do, you know, 10 to 20 percent of that initially on risk to make a print. So they make the print. They sell you 500,000 at um, 80 pence. Right now, the, the market maker probably doesn't even have a view in that stock. Right. Those poor guys that do the small caps have got about 200 stocks to look at. They, they don't even see the news till halfway through the day. So. If a client hits a market maker in stock, the job of the market maker is to try and unwind that risk position without hitting the stock, um, you know, as much as possible. But they have to find liquidity. So they'll go out and try and find liquidity from other brokers in the market and they're trying to unwind. To, to you guys and on retail share chats, 
it then looks like a JP Morgan or Morgan Stanley is hitting the price. But they're hitting the price because a client is trading the share. It's as simple as that. There's no manipulation. There's no, um, you know, they just, they're way too busy with 200 stocks and they probably got 200 positions. They're too busy trying to manage their risk to even think about moving stuff around for $50. For $500 when their P&L swings are 10,000 a day. So I'd like to put that one to bed um, because I do see them on the share chats as well. And it's just not true, I promise you. One that we get asked as well sometimes is, is there any form of manipulation on the, on <clears throat> the news flow of side of things? And I can tell you that I have never seen any. So at Bloomberg, they're called red stickies. They're just one lines mm -hmm. that come on. And for example, if someone's listening to, I don't know, JP, they'll be right in front and you'll see them just shooting off uh, yeah. one line, one line. There is no, I can guarantee you as well, there is no time whatsoever for that person to kind of, there's no pre-news pre conference, there's no pre-gambit, there's no, hey, heads up in fibers, this is what, no, the doors close, you are locked in that room and there is no one giving you a cheat sheet or anything that you can capture beforehand. You are typing it. The fastest typer basically gets <laughs> yeah. it out as fast as possible. Then there are stringent deadlines after that. So the next person who writes update one, that's why if you use the Bloomberg terminal, you see update one, update two, update three. Those all have time deadlines on them. And God forbid if that news reporter misses those deadlines because you have to be first first before the competition. Right. Everything's embargoed, isn't it? Yeah. So you don't have time to talk, people. You are just typing madly. And there's no time for spell check. So your spelling, it better be good. So those doors close. And all these things together go into taking responsibility for your own losses, right? The, the, the easy thing to do is try and shift the blame and say, oh, the stock's manipulated, or, oh, um, clearly the hedge funds know something that, that we don't because they've... They, there's, there's occasionally, there was a problem because the, um, the ECB, if you, if you had a certain connection, then you would hear the stream about four seconds before it came on to the rest of the television and stuff like that. So. So people were paying for that, but of course they got rid of that straight away as soon as they realized that that was, that was a problem. Mm. So good. Right. right. I hope yeah. that uh, helped uh, Andrew. Um, he said, thanks, Rich. Very helpful. Brilliant. Okay. Good. <laughs> <laughs> and thank you. You've been fantastic this week in your participation in the, the chat as well. Uh, R. Sachs has a question about um, BMPL as well. I said it's going to be a long one and you'll find out why on Monday. So I will, um, I, I trade BMPL really, really um, l l fascinating. I find Klarna and Affirm both, which I've had positions on recently and then undone them. So I will have that for you on Monday. Right, let's go on to question two, please. Oh, what role do emotions play in risk management? Um, I would say that it is perhaps the hardest part of the you know, managing your emotions. Every Humans are emotional, right, by nature. And so um, I take it as far as actually writing down how I felt the last time I traded the stock, um, making sure that you are, I was going to say of sound mind, but making sure that you are not mentally fatigued when you are trading something. Because sometimes you're like, oh, I made a loss on this last time. I really need to make it all back. And like Rich says, the market owes you nothing, mate. And the market remembers nothing about <laughs> your trades either. Um, you know, the mm. it's a really difficult one. And this is why I, I bring Isar on week after week, because he is a qualified psychologist mm. and he understands the market. So put those two things together. Yeah. It's incredible. If you watch the program Billions, you'll see that there was a... Um, a psychologist in-house in, -house in um, Axe Capital hedge fund, right? Now, when I was in hedge fund world, we also had a trading psychologist. 
he's almost a therapist, right? And he is a really high performance coach. He works with Barclays. He works with some of the biggest companies in London in the financial sector. Um, Pete Burdett, if a uh, big shout out to you. Um, but absolutely incredible the way that just sitting down and talking through your personal views on greed, on fear, um, on the need, you know, are you trading something to win, to be right, or to make money, right? Because they're very different. Mm. You, you should go, well, obviously, if I'm right, I'm gonna make money. No, not always. Mm. Um, you know, there, there's a real, because the danger there is that you're wrong, and then you run the position that you are wrong because you think eventually I've got to be right in this. Mm. No. No. Nope. You know, look at... Um... Right move, Ange. Well, yeah, I was, I was <laughs> going to bring that one. I'm trying to think one where, I, where I've just had a shocker in the past. And as I say, I've been trading for 22 years and I still know that I get them wrong. And it's identifying the ones that are just wrong in this. And don't be afraid about, you know, thinking, well, he's going to think I'm really, oh, Andrew and Richard are going to think I'm really stupid for asking a question. There are no stupid questions. Um, you can ask Rich. I still go over to Rich and I, and, and you'll find your Rich, you'll find your, you'll find your Bob as well. You'll find your Rich. <laughs> yeah, well, <I'm> <laughs> You'll find your Rich. And, you know, <coughs> it happens in even the pits, live trading pits. You have people just walk over and, hey, I've got, I've got this trade in mind, but I'm not so sure about it. What do you think about it? You know, use trusted people as a, 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 a sounding board before you take the position. Don't go and sound the board after you've taken the position. Do it before and make sure that you are not, you know, emotionally involved in this. You know, don't buy into it because you heard a really good mate um, is telling you to buy into this thing or, you know, you're, your your brother-in-law, you know, happens oh, yeah, to work tips his from firm. Friends oh. And oh, it's not this is not horse no. racing, right? This is this is investing and um, you know, getting tips from the friends. It happens to the professionals as well. They all mm. go around and go, oh yeah, there's this little oil um, exploration company, and it's just a, a classic. We see it all the time. And if you've if you followed every tip that you heard, then they're they they just over the, the long term, that's not the way to go. The way to go is to fundamentally get into that company, um, learn what it does, learn what the management team's like, uh, learn what the numbers look like, learn what the technical analysis is, and it's boring. Be more boring. It's really boring, but it's useful, right? So that's what makes it exciting. And a shout out to, um, extra shout out to SR as well. Um, he uh, came on the show with Rich and talked about, you know, to to commit to grit or quit, right? So those two are very different things too. You can't. Right, right, so oh, what makes right, it so oh, maybe this heard me say SR. It's like suddenly decided to play it. I have no idea why. But um, it's about when you decide to hold your position because your theory is is what you're holding you've already got your your projection you've got your exit point for that trade you've got i like to put lines to know when to exit and enter but it's also important to know when to quit you know maybe it, there's been a there's been a change of leadership maybe the company's just suddenly come out and said it's going to uh it's found this debt pile it didn't know about right so it's important to understand when to commit to grit or quit. Watch that episode uh, with SR and Rich because it's super useful. Um, this, I mean, this is just, it's a, it's a longer topic, right? It's a, it's a really important one because everybody can look at the numbers and everybody can, um, you know, take in that data, take in that technical analysis. But if you, you can't get hold of your own ego, um, then that's where a lot of the, the mistakes really come from. And it's, yeah, looking at yourself in the mirror and saying, ah, oh, I'm wrong here. I am wrong in this one. Um, and it's, uh, it's so important because then you can look at ways to, to manage that position, right? Still, if you are still trying to build into a position that fundamentally you actually know at heart you're wrong in, 
then you're just getting yourself into a deeper mess and you're putting your whole capital at risk. But if you can look at it and say, I'm wrong here, then you can start looking at option structures. You can start looking at um, putting a, a really strict stop loss on a quarter of the position, a half the position, um, and yet you can uh, you get to terms with it. I'm wrong at least at least once a week, if not more. There you go. Wrong more than that. <laughs> <laughs> How many trades do you put on a week? I, no, no, I'm talking about like just generally, not just trades, but ah, everything, okay, right? in life. In, in life, in life. I love and, it. I'm wrong how, at least once a week. I'm, <clears throat> and that's how you should take a look at this because you know, it's only being wrong that you you then learn and then you find out. I know it sounds you know really kind of corny, but then you learn how to get better at the game, um, and it's the same with sport. Good next question, please. How do you set effective stop loss levels to protect capital? Now, this is interesting because I like quite tight stop losses. Um, and that is because I look for entry and exit points. Um, and I, um, uh, I like uh, momentum trading, I like swing trading. And so that for me is what I'm comfortable with. Just showing you oil, for example, because we have a lot of uh, oil trader friends here taking a look at WTI. Um, and here you can see that uh, I have got uh, a line at the 7232, uh, 7232 level um, and I am waiting and I've put that there because I am perhaps looking at that as a signal of things changing. But at the moment, um, I think there is further downside for crude to come and I am looking at perhaps an exit point at where the price action last was at this level, so it's about 70, 76. Now, you hear Axel talk about where the price action is the last week. You hear him talk about where it closed last week. This is, there's a reason for that, and it's because it's a key psychological level. And what you're looking for is if it breaches that level, you're looking further back for the last time it closed firmly um, where you can see the buyers, right? So it's all about resistance and support. You're looking for the next support level. Similarly, if you're going long, I'm looking for the peaks. Uh, and so for gold, which is in, in a still and strong upward uh, trend there. So let's take a look at the daily chart and zoom that out for you. It has come off, but the overall long-term trend is still up. Um, and as you can see here, it has dipped below that line that I've drawn, but I am still looking for this week's high. And I haven't entered because I want to see it get higher than that. You're looking also for points of resistance because the further back when we've had that point of resistance, the more you know that there is there is a group of buyers out there, right? You see a group of buyers and you know that someone or many people will scoop in and buy at that point. Similarly, if you see that there's a resistance, it keeps bouncing off that stock, then you're gonna put your exit point slightly below there because you don't wanna get caught by algos. You know that there are lots of bag holders, lots of people waiting for it to get there and then they're going to dump that stock because they've been holding for so long, right? They've been holding for so long, like right move Ange. I'm just waiting for it to get there so I can get rid of that stock. So um, I hope that has been helpful. I, I, we, um, we also had a trading psychologist in Credit Suisse in 2009. I have to get his name out because he's a really good American guy. And he said, if you get to the point of wanting to get rid of a position, but you're just waiting. Or you're crying. Right. Or <laughs> you're praying. If you are praying for a, you know, a John Wood to bounce today, or if you're praying for, um, you know, what a Vodafone to have good numbers next week, right? You're too big in that position. It means too much to you that if you're under such stress that you're actually praying for something, you know, that isn't world peace or, you know, your family to be healthy or, you know, the important things in the world, you know, praying for a position to come right, I don't think that's gone God's top priority list. So, um, yeah, that's that's when you know you're too big. 
And if you're, if you're waking up in the middle of the night, then that is also a time to think about um, somehow managing that position and stop losses are a great way to do that. Dales Boy also asking uh, whether we use moving averages. Um, Dales Boy, yes, I do use a moving average, um, especially when it's to do uh, with indices. Um, Rich, do you use moving averages? Uh, you, so my view on technical analysis is evolving. Like, <laughs> I'm becoming more of a believer. The more I listen to you and Axel Rudolph, the more that I see the usefulness of it. But I still don't get moving averages how it's... All right, it shows you a trend. But if it's... I'll give you the, the perfect example. I was, um, I was having a run through Hyde Park on Saturday and I had uh, downtown Josh Brown mm -hmm. on Compound and Friends. So, so Josh has been in the market pretty much exactly the same amount of time as I have. And he... Um, but in, you know, working on Wall Street... And he now works for Ritz Holt, Ritz Holt Wealth Management. And he does this uh, podcast called Compound and Friends. It's brilliant. Him and Mike Batnick. And they had somebody on and they said, if you look at the rolling three-year performance of the S&P 500, it, um, it, it always goes higher. And it goes higher on 8.4% um, average move. And her point was that now we've had a huge rally and everybody's saying, oh, the market looks awful high here. The market looks awful high. She said, no, if you look at it on the three month, three year rolling average, then it looks cheap. Hmm. And I was starting to think, I was like, well, that's because you've had 2021, 2022, 2023 hmm. and 2024. Um, it, it, was including the high watermarks mm. of early 2022, mm. right? Mm. So that meant that it, it looked cheap. But in six months' time, it's going to look really expensive because you, you annualise that and you take it from here and it's gone up, what are we up from the 2022 lows, 50%, mm. 100%? So what you're saying, Rich, is you want something that smoothens out no, I, t I say that if something looks great on a 40-day moving average, but it looks terrible on a 70-day moving average, it just, it's just time. Time moves on, and those averages completely change. So time moves on. If, like Rich, this bit annoys you, because I, I get that. I get why that would annoy you. So because... I think people take technical analysis, and they, they've already got an idea of what they want it to say, and they put that in, and they go, that's why. Ah, see, that's the wrong way around. I use technical analysis not on its own. It's like a really good friend, right? It's a good friend that when you're hiking or you're skiing and your peace map is so wet, it gets ripped up in your pocket and you're kind of like, I have no idea where I am. <laughs> I'm not. And someone then comes and says and pats you and says, well, the sun's that way. It could be that way, right? It gives you signals that I won't necessarily go that way, but now I kind of know where east and west is, right? And so... Yeah, but that's a, that's a fact. Yes, that is a fact. However, how I would use this is when I look at a chart, if I don't have, let's say I don't, let's say it's not like, you know, uh, one that I trade um, um, that often, and I see, wait a minute, there's a strange divergence here going on. And that's not just on one um, signal, it's on two. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like, a flag. This looks interesting. Why is this happening? And there has to be at least two signals. With regards to, I've had questions before from clients asking, is there a way of, you know, with the moving averages, uh, Dale's Boy smoothing out that time frame? Some technicians like using a uh, volume weighted uh, moving average or weighted moving average. Have you used that before? Volume weighted moving average? No. Yeah, so it just kind of smoothens out the time frame and the volumes. Uh, it is on the IG platform. Uh, if you click on that bar chart and you go down to the bottom, and I'm going to unclick that, and you've got volume weighted moving average at the bottom, um, which, you know, have a look at that because that I'm could upset. be something that you might like using. It's a moving average weighted to account for volume over a time frame. <laughs>